Okay, uh, we'll get started. Um, I think you guys had a good break. Uh, okay, so I was talking about, uh, you know, reminding you guys about pathway enrichment analysis. Um, we have a, a gene list, we have gene attributes like pathways, and we want to find which pa attributes or pathways are enriched in the gene list. And there's a couple of tools that are available like David and GSEA. We'll be talking mostly about David, although I'll mention GSEA. So gene set enrichment analysis is the more specific term that you might find for this pathway enrichment analysis. And um, the, uh, the idea, as I've mentioned, is that you, um, you have a, a, a bunch of gene sets which are related to pathways, for instance, or parts of the cell. And then you take your gene list and you find out, um, so here's some gene expression data and we have some, some um, uh, Illumina IDs or um, that, that come from this, and we, we, we might, uh, this might be GenBank IDs, I'm not sure. We, can, we, we have some identifiers that come from this experiment. Um, these might be um, uh, ranked by, by some value or just a, a flat list, and um, they're categorized in, in, in these different uh, categories. And then we ask, is the um, cell cycle, list of known cell cycle genes, is it significantly enriched? Um, in this gene list, and we might know if this is the, the set of genes that are upregulated, um, that we know are upregulated, maybe it's, we can also assign it to enriched in the upregulated section, and p53 might be downregulated, and we can, if we know that this part of the list is downregulated, we might be able to say p53 is downregulated, and this nuclear pore and ribosome are not significant. So that's the, the idea. We, we have um, gene lists, uh, we have our gene list, um, and our gene set database and we use an enrichment test to find <laughs> pathways, for instance, that are, that are enriched. Um, just a couple of notes. Um, the, uh, this ex uh, the gene list that comes from experimental data, uh, I'm a, it's a little bit confusing because there's a lot of different types of gene lists. Uh, so I always use the term gene, I try to always use the term gene list for the gene list that comes from your experiment. So it's your list of genes that you're interested in. That's the gene list. And then um, a list, uh, a set of genes that are in a pathway, I usually try and use the term gene set. So it's, it's a known set of genes that are related to each other. Um, and um, so, so the gene list that we have from our experiment, uh, we, we search against the database of, of previous knowledge um, that is present in gene set databases, like all the known pathways. And then we do our enrichment test, and we, um, we find uh, pathways that are enriched, and then we interpret this list. And we, um, importantly, we might find additional, hypo this, this, list might, this list of enriched pathways might suggest additional hypotheses that we would then follow up. So it might, if you're just interested in summarizing a, a list of genes, you might stop here and just think and just report the results. We found these pathways enriched in my gene list. Um, but if you're interested in following up on that, you might say, oh, pathways are enriched in apoptosis. How can I test if that's, you know, what can I do with that knowledge? Maybe I can design an experiment that uses an apoptosis inhibitor and, and that might be, uh, that might ha have a major effect on my, on my cells if I have uh, um, cancer cell lines available. So this is how um, the enrichment, so I'm going to go into details, a little bit more details about that, how the enrichment test works um, statistically, and I'm also going to tell you some of the important additional things that, you, that you're going to need to know. This next part is very conceptual. It's uh, applicable to any enrichment test, but they'll, then we'll focus on one particular product, one particular software that, that um, is web-based. So, um, so here's the, the gene list, this rectangle here, and um, I've defined uh, the, the, the yellow um, square indicates the list of genes that I've defined as significant somehow. Um, and in this case, say, I, I'll typically use examples from microarray from gene expression data because that's sort of the type of data that's most has, has most been analyzed by this type of, ta of um, analysis. Um, so these, these uh, yellow genes might be the up-regulated genes. And, um, and all the rest of the genes are just genes that are not significant, 
potentially they're not maybe not significantly ex uh, differentially expressed, and so that's just the general background. Um, uh, okay, so I take the list of genes that are that are interesting, that are significant, um, significant in the experiment, um, and I compare them to a gene list. Um, the gene list is the circle. So the, the circle represents genes that are in a pathway, um, and I um, I look at the overlap and I say, oh, there's a certain fraction of of uh, significant genes that are um, of, of important genes in my experiments that are overlapping this pathway, they're part of this pathway, and there's a certain list of background genes that are overlapping this pathway. And then I want to know, is this overlap larger than I expect by random sampling of the array genes? If I just roll the dice and I select genes randomly, um, this is maybe a random, this square is a random list of genes that I select randomly from, from the array. Here's another one that I select randomly from the array, and I want to know um, you know, how often a set of genes of this, this many genes, maybe this is 30 genes or something, how often if I select 30 genes do I get uh, this much overlap in the gene set versus the gene list? So the way to answer that question, I mean, one way you can answer that question is roll the dice and just keep on trying uh, 30, you know, each time you pick 30 gene lists and 30, 30 genes and you see how much it overlaps a particular pathway. Um, but that's time consuming. You have to do that thousands of times. So um, there's a statistical test called a Fisher's exact test, which is also known as the hypergeometric test, which computes this information for you and you get a p-value from that, from that test. So, um, so the, this is uh, the gene list. This is a list of genes from my experiment. And here's my background population. I have um, a certain number of uh, blue genes here and a certain number of red genes. And the, um, the, uh, um, I have a particular gene list, and there's a, there's a, um, I just randomly picked this gene list from this, this background population. I might expect to see, um, sorry, I might, if I, if I, um, if I randomly ex pick some, gene, some genes from this, ex from this uh, bin, I might expect to see more red genes because um, there's 4,500 red genes and 500 blue genes. So, um, but in my gene list, I have four blue genes and one red gene. So it looks like my gene list is highly enriched for blue genes. It seems like you know, if I was randomly picking, I would get um, one out of 10 uh, blue genes. But here I have four out of five. So um, the null hypothesis of this test sort of, it basically you want to know if blue is enriched compared to a random sample from the population. Um, or, you know, the alternative hypothesis is that there's more blue genes than we expect. Okay, so this is based on the hybrid geometric distribution, which you may, people, may, people statisticians may, in the audience may know about quite a bit. Um, this is the expected distribution that you'll pick a certain number of uh, blue genes here from this bin, um, given a set of, of, of given this gene list. So um, here's the probability that I'll select zero blue genes, popular, po the probability that I'll select one blue gene, two blue genes, etc. cetera. Um, the fact, the, whether, you know, the, the um, probability that I'll, that I'll pick four blue genes is, um, is, uh, the, is um, the sum actually of picking four blue genes or um, um, five blue genes? Basically, all the all the genes that are um, all the, the numbers that are higher than the, the number here. So we don't have five genes, um, but that's four is included in, in five. So um, the sum of this is the, the p-value, basically the probability that we'll get four genes. So it's four point six times ten to the negative four, which is very significant. So it's very rare that I would. Uh, pick four blue genes out of this list, out of a list of, of five here. Um, so the, uh, typically this, this we, we like to think of this as the uh, over-enrichment. So we have um, blue genes are enriched. Or it says black here, but because it comes out blue on this screen, I'm, 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 I'm just converting it to, to uh, blue. Um, so uh, Normally we're talking about enrichment, over-enrichment, but you can also test for under-enrichment. Um, so the under-enrichment of black is the over-enrichment of red, so that's the opposite. Um, the other important thing is that you need to choose a background pop population appropriately. So if you have, um, if you have uh, 
uh, an array um, or an experiment that can only that can only um, that doesn't sample the entire genome. It only samples half of the genome. For instance, your, say your experiment is a microarray that only has half the genes in the genome on it. Um, you can't ever find genes that are not on the array, not on the microarray. And so you shouldn't include those in your statistical test. That's not part of the background. You could never find a gene from there, so it shouldn't be part of the, 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 the background of, um, that, that you use to calculate the expected amount of, um, of genes that you, might, that you get. So, um, so the background population is the uh, genes that you could find in your experiment. For next generation sequencing analysis, it's any gene, right? Because any gene could, um, you could find DNA from any gene. It's not, it's not um, uh, really restricted unless you do something like exome sequencing, which then you have, um, uh, you've selected for specific exons, and those might be not covering every gene in the genome, every known gene. So that might be a, a more restricted background. Um, so the... Um, if you have, uh, so, so, so far this Fisher's exact test, as I've, as I've explained it, is useful for testing the enrichment of one pathway. So if just one pathway, we can do a Fisher's exact test. If I want to do more pathways, you repeat Fisher's exact test. So, um, um, and I'll, I'll mention that later a little bit more. Okay, so one of the problems that happens in, with statistical tests is that uh, you may, you might, um, if you keep on doing the same test over and over again, you might find that you, um, that you, one of your random draws. So say I, say I, I pick, um, say, say if I, I, I want to find out what the probability of picking four black, in here it turned out properly, black genes out of a list of five. Um, say I, um, I want to know what the probability of this is, and I just keep on picking genes randomly from this bin. Um, so I pick a bunch of genes randomly, I get a whole bunch of different types of uh, draws, and then eventually, a few thousand draws later, I, get, I, I find one that has uh, four black genes out of five. And um, the problem with, this is sort of a, a way of winning the, the lottery by playing many, many times. So if you wanted to know the, the probability of winning a, the lottery, um, if you keep on, um, you, someone tells you that it's, uh, there's a particular probability of winning the lottery, that's the probability for playing once and winning the lottery, one out of a million. So you have a one in a million chance if you play the lottery once. But if you play the lottery one million times, probably you're going to win, right? Because um, the, uh, the, um, you expect a random draw with the observed enrichment, in this case, once every one over p-value draws. So, um, so you have to correct for this if you're doing multiple tests. This is a little bit worse if, um, so this is sort of more, this is the, um, what's called the multiple testing correction, um, what's called multiple testing correction, and it's the multiple testing problem. So if you keep on running the same test over and over again, um, you will, by chance, find something interesting, and um, you need to correct for that. So, um, and it depends on the number of tests that you're doing. So here's an example that's a little bit closer to pathways. Here's, um, here's a list of genes, and I have, um, say, black circles are one particular pathway, and s squares are another particular pathway. So I, I find a mix of genes, and some of them are circles, some of them are squares, some of them are red, some of them are black. Those are two different pathways, red versus black, or circle versus square, I guess, and red versus black. Um, so the... Um, uh, if I um, if I keep uh, um, uh, if I so so that's equivalent of, of if I if I do the the um, um, uh, if I if I draw sort of a random sample of genes but then I evaluate different annotations that with using the Fisher's exact test each time that's another way of doing the same test over and over again. So what we do in gene center enrichment analysis is we take your gene list and we, uh, we take a, a gene set from the database, like a pathway, and we use Fisher's exact test to evaluate the p-value uh, of enrichment. And we take the next gene set in the, data, in the database, another pathway, and we evaluate it. And we take the next pathway and we evaluate it. And we keep on doing that for all the different pathways. And so each time um, we ask is this particular pathway enriched in, in this gene list? And that's 
multiple tests. So on a, at a certain frequency, you might expect one of those many pathways to be enriched just by chance. So that's sort of a, a different way of a little bit. It's the same problem, multiple test, testing problem, but it's slightly di um, different way of thinking about it. So, um, so there's a number of standard corrections for this problem. Uh, people may have heard of Bonferroni correction. This is named after a person who discovered it. But basically, you take the number of tests and you multiply it by the original p-value, and you get a corrected p-value. Um, so this is the, the number of annotations that we tested, the number of pathways that we tested. Um, and the, the technical definition for this is the, the corrected p-value is greater than or equal to the probability that any any one of the observed enrichments could be due to random draws. So if I, um, if I, um, uh, it basically, it, it, it wants to make sure that none of your, um, the Bonferroni correction tries to give you a p-value that you can trust so in a, such that um, the, there, there are none of your, none of your uh, significant hits are expected to be um, significant by random chance. Um, and the jargon for this is controlling for the family-wise error rate. Um, so that's fairly common. You might see that in a number of tools, this Bonferroni correction. One of the problems with Bonferroni is that it can be very stringent and can wash away real enrichments that are interesting. And so often people are willing to accept a less stringent condition, which is the false discovery rate, um, which leads to a gentler correction. Uh, and so often you'll also see false discovery rate. And false discovery rate is probably one of the uh, most commonly used uh, multiple testing corrections because it's a little bit gentler. And so um, people, uh, so this is not, this is the, um, the definition is that, is that it's the expected proportion of the observed enrichments that are due to random chance. So if you have, if you've done a uh, enrichment analysis with a thousand pathways um, and you have a, you're satisfied with a false discovery rate of 5%, then it means that 5% of your results might be due to random chance, um, but maybe that's, that's okay for you. So it's, it's contrast that with the Bonferroni correction, which um, prevents sort of any one of the uh, observed enrichments to be due to random chance, theoretically. So um, this is a little bit, a little bit um, more gentle because it allows you to uh, get some false discovery rate in there, but you, you know what it is. You can set it to be, I don't want to have more than 5% false, false piece of information, but you, you'll get more signal. You could potentially get more signal that way. Yeah? Is there, if somebody wants to come deeper and they would use false discovery rate, they be like, well, this is not any of that piece of that knowledge. Is it something that is commonly used and accepted in general? So the question is, um, is the false discovery rate generally accepted? And um, for, um, it depends, I guess, on your question and how important it is to avoid false false positives. Um, if you, in general, for enrichment analysis, many people use the false discovery rate because um, um, people have found that Bonferroni is too stringent. Um, what you could do is you could try Bonferroni, and then if you don't get any enrichments, you could try to set a false discovery rate of 5% or 1% or 10% uh, or 1% and see if you get more enrichments, in, uh, more pathways that are enriched at that uh, stringency. So for something like pathway enrichment, where it's more of a discovery exploration type of um, analysis, it's, it's probably OK for you to um, uh, accept some false positives given, given uh, the, in, in, as a trade-off for getting more signal, um, because you're going to manually, you're going to look at the results and, and evaluate them. Um, so um, the, uh, but for something else, you might, you might want the more stringent test. So um, does that answer your question? So um, oh, yeah, that's what I was going to say. There's also, depending on the, on the software that's, that's, in you, that's being used, um, there might be uh, particular ways that the p-value is computed uh, that, that are based on random sampling. So instead of using a Fisher's test, um, the GSEA software, which I'll talk about at the very end briefly, um, uses a, a random, it, it tries to uh, simulate um, the, whole, the whole enrichment system and randomly, it randomly creates lots of gene sets and sees how often you get, a, it get, calculates a p-value based on kind of a random simulation. So it actually tries thousands of different possibilities and 
computes it just like that rolling the dice picture that I, I had before. And um, so sometimes some software might, might um, uh, you, you want to use a, an FDR that's higher or lower because of the, uh, the random model is not exactly this uh, perfect for your situation. And you, um, you uh, I don't know if I'm, I'm not really explaining this well, but uh, there, there could be um, the, the take home message that I'm trying to get across is that if you use different software that have very different types of enrichment analysis techniques, they might have different acceptable F false discovery rates. 10% um, or 20% um, might be okay for some, some, some analyses. Um, and so you can kind of tune it and see where you, what, so what I like to do is, is uh, try different false discovery rates and see what the results are. Um, one of the things I, I like to do is, is if I'm worried about if the false discovery rate, if uh, setting different uh, parameters like choosing Bonferroni or false discovery rate at different levels, if that, uh, if, I, I, if I'm worried if that, if that affects my results, I'll try different ones and see if, it, if I always get the same answer, then it doesn't affect my results. Right? And so then it's not an issue. Um, if I get very different answers by using these different parameters, then I know that I need to be a little bit more careful and think about the results a little bit more carefully in terms of false positives. Um, okay, so uh, you might see FDR, um, typically they're, they're, these corrections are calculated using the benjamini hopberg procedure, which I, I won't go into, but um, and I think um, I forgot to put it on the wiki. There's a great uh, document that's available online that I'll, I'll add to the wiki as a link that goes through um, explains multiple testing correction very very clearly and there's other there's others than than just these two um, but you might see this in tools Benjamini Hochberg FDR or Benjamini you know any any name sometimes the the FDR threshold is called a Q value so you might see that in tools as well okay so I talked about the Fisher test, which is also called the hypergeometric test. So when you go to these, these software, you'll see that, those, those names. And uh, Bonferroni and um, uh, Benjamini Hochberg false discovery rate as multiple testing corrections. Um, that's for gene lists that are well defined. So here, um, if I have a, a set of genes that, um, so that might be perfect for, for experiments where your um, experiment just generates a gene list. Examples are, um, you know, mutation, as assessing all the, the genes that are mutated in a particular sample. There's only a certain limited number of genes that are mutated, um, and, and that's my gene list. Now, if you have some, as I, I mentioned earlier, if you have some value that allows you to rank genes, um, you might uh, know that, that there's genes that are more mutated and genes that are less mutated. Um, or you might know that genes, there's genes that are upregulated compared to control or downregulated compared to control given gene expression data. So in that case, if you want to create a gene list, you have to um, choose a threshold. So here we've chosen a threshold that, uh, say, for instance, my threshold is um, I care about genes that are more than twi you know, twice overexpressed compared to twofold overexpressed compared to control, and also genes that are twofold less expressed compared to control. Um, or underexpressed. Um, so I've chosen that threshold. I've drawn a line here. And all these genes in gray here become, imagine this is a ranked list. All these genes here become, I, I just don't include them in my analysis. Now the problem with that is that um, I'm throwing away information potentially here. And I've chosen a threshold two times overexpressed, two times un underexpressed, that might not really be the best threshold. And it's sometimes very difficult to, to choose the threshold because you, you just sort of um, choose one that people people typically use, but you don't really have a very good um, evidence for choosing that one and not another one. So there's a second set of um, enrichment tests that use a ranked list, and they don't throw away any genes. These there's no gray genes here that are thrown away. So instead, you use the uh, full list of genes, um, and they're ranked in this case for gene expression data from upregulated to downregulated. And the most popular software that implements a test like that is GSEA, which, um, how many people have actually used GSEA, Gene Set Enrichment Analysis Software? So a few people have used it. Um, the, um, I don't, we ha have, don't have time in this course to really go through that in detail, but um, it's, if you have a ranked gene list, um, you can try out GSEA. It's a pretty easy tool to use, and there's lots of tutorials. Um, and uh, there's other statistical tests that are available for ranked lists. And what these 
just briefly because I don't have any slides specifically going into the details, but um, what these, these uh, te statistical tests do is they assign a p-value to a particular pathway um, by looking to see if the genes in that pathway are clustered at the top of the list or at the bottom of the list more than you'd expect. So if you just took a specific pathway, if you just took a pathway like apoptosis and you had any random set of genes that were ranked, you might expect apoptosis genes to be all over the place, equally at the top, equally at the bottom, equally at the middle. They just, you know, if you just ticked off every gene that was in apoptosis going down the list, you'd expect to have an even distribution. So there's there are statistical tests that um, tell you how what 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 the probability is of um, having a particular distribution, maybe all of your apoptosis genes are all the way at the top. All the top genes are apoptosis. That's very different than uh, a, a case where apoptosis genes are spread all over this list. And so the p-value that you get from these tests tells you the difference between that. Um, and um, so the, the, main, the main sort of take-home message here is that if you have a, a plain gene list that's not ranked, you can definitely use Fisher's exact test, no problem. Um, the David tool that we'll talk about later. Um, if you have a ranked gene list, you can and and you can choose a threshold that you might be interested in. You can use David, but if you want to use all the genes in your ranked gene list, then you can use one of these. These um, well, GSEA is the most popular tool. Um, and if you're interested in the statistical test, you can look the Wilcoxon Man Whitney test or the Kamalgarov Smirnov test, KS test. So you might have heard of some of these things, but we're not going to go into detail on it. Okay, so. Um, the um, any questions so far? Okay, so I guess the, the key the key point is that um, at the end of doing an enrichment test, searching all of the different pathways and and gene function p informa uh, sorry piece of information about gene function that you have, you um, you get a list of genes. Sorry, you get a list of, of enriched go terms or enriched terms, a list, a, a, enriched pathways, and a p-value that's associated with each one. And that p-value can be corrected by multiple testing correction. So um, the tool that we've chosen to use in the lab is called David. Um, it's uh, from the National Institutes of Health. And they've made a, a website that allows you to upload a gene list, and then it will run an enrichment analysis uh, for you. And the reason we chose um, there's, a, there's probably a hundred tools out there that do this enrichment analysis, so you'll see it all over the place. Um, it's, it's actually fairly easy to construct tools that do this, but we chose David because um, it, it has a nice website, and it is, um, so that's fairly easy to use, and it has um, uh, a lot of gene lists that you can, you can use and choose among. So um, I'm just going to go over this very quickly in PowerPoint slides, and then we're going to start the lab. And for the lab, we have uh, a protocol that we've, we've developed uh, for this course that you can just follow that Veronique um, put together. Um, and um, and so, so just um, as a quick summary, uh, when, you go to, when you go to David, um, you can, there's some links up here. One of them is Start Analysis. So you click that Start Analysis one, and this will all be in the protocol, so you can follow it. Um, or you can check out check it out. Um, you might be pretty obvious when you just look at this. So start analysis. That takes you to a page that looks like this. You can click on the upload tab and it allows you to upload a gene list. If you don't have a gene list, you can just use the demonstration list that they have here. Um, but you paste a gene list in here. So I pasted in, in this case, a list of, of, glio of genes that are frequently mutated in glioblastoma um, that are from um, that I mentioned earlier, that are on the wiki. Um, and then you have to choose the list type, uh, which is gene list or background. So remember I talked about background. Um, you need to know the background of your experiment. So for next generation sequencing, it's probably every gene in the genome. But if you have an array, a uh, microarray that only has a certain set of genes on it, that's your background. You can um, define your own background in David. Um, but David also has a whole set of backgrounds that are already known. So a lot of common microarray platforms are already stored in David. Um, so, but it's important to select the list type, which is a gene list. It's not your background list. So if you wanted to upload your own background list, which is the list of all genes on your microarray or the list of all the genes that you could see in your experiment, you could, you could upload a background gene list and save it in your, in your set of gene lists. 
and or you could upload your actual gene list, which is the one that you want to calculate the uh, enrichment for, um, and you can submit the list at the end. If David doesn't, if David asks you to select an identifier, so we, um, in this case, these gene names are official gene symbols for uh, Hugo gene names, um, Hugo symbols that are officially recognized, and so I can choose official gene symbol. If you don't know what identifier you have, um, you can you can select don't know, and um, or if David, if you choose the wrong one, if David doesn't recognize the, your genes, it will try to detect the correct identifiers to use, and it will give you a summary. It says I don't recognize your your um, um, you know I didn't recognize your identifier type. Do you want to um, let David try and guess your identifier type? And you can click this button to guess the type. Um, it's better if you um, it sort of seems to work better for us and for the labs that we're doing tomorrow if you actually know the identifier type and you choose the, the right one. Um, and the reason is, is because if you let David do it, David converts everything to its own internal identifier. And when you want to download the results, you have the David internal identifier and then you have yet another identifier which you don't want. It doesn't give you your original identifiers back. Um, okay, so uh, um, that was uploading gene lists. Uh, if I click on the list tab, then I can choose the species that I'm looking at. Um, gene symbols are similar between human and mouse, so David will might complain that um, it doesn't know what organism you, you are talking about, so choose one. Um, and then the list that I uploaded is here. I make sure that's selected. And then um, uh, the second step is I analyze the list. And there's a few different types of analyses. The sort of basic analysis is the functional annotation chart, and the, the tutorial that we've given you has all this information. And this is the this when I click on that link, I get this result, and it's a little bit hard to see here. Um, but uh, the top most enriched gene or uh, type of gene is kinase. It's from Swiss Prot keywords. Um, then there's uh, trans membrane receptor protein tyrosine kinase activity, which is like a gene ontology term. Um, for molecular function, MF, fat, which means it's not, it's not slim. Um, tyrosine protein kinase, uh, which is from Interpro. Interpro is a database of domain, uh, of protein domains. Um, here's some more Swiss Pro key keywords. Here's an Interpro domain. Here's another Go term, BP, means bio biological process. Um, and all the rest of these genes are biological process. Phosphorylation, uh, phosphorus metabolic process, transmembrane receptor, and uh, in fact, if you know biology of these genes, you'll, or of these terms, um, you'll recognize that actually they're all related to kinases and, phosph and phosphorylation metabolism, um, and, and, um, and if, if the, and the, which is actually very important in, in cancer. Um, and here's the, uh, the, um, the number of genes that are um, in the list that are associated with this um, uh, term and the p-value uh, and the uh, Benjamini Hochberg corrected p-value. So the p-value that that when you use David, you'll you'll you might come across um, they call the the p-value. They some mostly they use p-value, but sometimes they use something called the ease score, E A S E. And Ease is a name of their software before it was called David. And the Ease score is basically a Fisher's exact test that they modified slightly. And if you look in the documentation, you can see that they um, basically have the same test, but it, they add uh, a small, they make, change the numbers by a very small amount to, um, for a specific reason that, I don't, I don't know why they, they, they did it that way, but um, it's, uh, it slightly changes the p-values for small gene sets. Um, and the, um, so this p-value is actually not an exact Fisher's exact test. If you're comparing between tools, you might notice that it's a modified Fisher's exact test, but otherwise it's the same idea. Um, and you can also download this file, um, and you get all the results as a, as a text file. The next, uh, I'm going to give a lecture about network visualization and analysis. Um, I just wanted to, before con going uh, further on this, I wanted to mention a few more points that came out that were uh, questions that were asked during the lab about enrichment analysis. So, um, some people uh, there was a, there was one question that came up about uh, gene set size. So um, I forgot to mention that if you have uh, a gene set that's really big, 
uh, like one of the top level gene ontology terms, like biological process, which is basically every every gene. Um, you know, you could have a gene set, a gene set that has 300 genes in it or 500 genes in it. Those genes, if they come up, are less likely to be meaningful because it's so general. So it doesn't really tell you something very specific about what you're looking at, even though it might actually be enriched. So, um, so typically, a lot of enrichment analysis tools throw those large gene lists away. And I think the gene ontology, the go term fat list, already kind of has some filtering. Um, so they, David has some basic filtering. Um, and Veronique, do you know if you can change that filtering? Um, if you can change the size of, do you know if you can change the size in David um, of the, like change the, the filtering of um, uh, gene lists by size, gene sets by size? Like choose go terms that are more than 250 or, I don't think so, yeah, I haven't been able to see anything like that. In GSEA it's possible to do that. You can choose the particular gene sets that, like the size of gene sets you want to work, work with. Um, the other problem with G, uh, gene sets is very small gene sets. So if you have a gene set of size one or two or three, um, it's very easy. If you just get one gene out of three, then you'll probably find that it's enriched. So there's not a lot of dis ability to distinguish between um, statistically between uh, in for enrichments of very small gene lists. So those usually get filtered away as well. Um, um, the other uh, question that a couple of people asked was, how is this different than Ingenuity? So Ingenuity is a commercial package that uh, does enrichment analysis in it, and um, the, um, uh, it has a, they have their own curated database. So they probably use gene ontology, but they also curate a lot of additional things. So you probably get different gene sets from, from them. Um, and then there's, a, there's also a question about um, you, if you use different tools, and you get different results. What does that mean? Um, probably that means that the different tools have u are using different versions of gene ontology. Um, one downloaded it in 2010 and one downloaded it just yesterday or something. And gene ontology is growing all the time, so one database, one tool might have a, a better, newer version of gene ontology. Or they might use different gene sets, like some of them might use um, additional gene sets that are not present in the other one. Um, and then the other reason why they might be different is they use slightly different uh, statistics. So you just have to look at what the p how the p-values are calculated. Like they might use different, um, different uh, um, multiple testing corrections. Okay. Um, okay. Any other questions at the lab? I think you guys had a um, good chance to go through that. Um, okay, so I talked about gene lists and gene sets. Um, we know more information about, about genes than just the fact that a set of genes are associated with a pathway. We, we might know that genes are connected to each other, right? And this is, an, uh, for instance, maybe genes, are, uh, interact, or genes encode proteins that interact. Um, and so this is an additional piece of information that can be used, um, and um, I differentiate that by calling that network analysis. Um, one of the differences, one of the sort of advantages of network analysis over um, gene set analysis is that gene sets, uh, or typical pathway enrichment analysis, is that pathway enrichment analysis depends on someone else's definition of a pathway. Um, so you might um, not always agree that all the gene ontology terms are annotated properly or the way that you want. Um, you could always annotate them yourselves, but that is um, very time consuming, although some people do it um, for specific projects. So if you have a large network of, of, um, of connected proteins, like a protein interaction network, all your, or, or genes and they're connected based on functional relationships, um, and you have a set of mutated genes, you might be able to uh, or if you have your gene list, which may come from a, be a set of mutated genes, like the example that we gave you, the GBM genes, um, you can see how they're connected in that network. And if there's regions in that network that are highly enriched in genes in your list, then that is um, an interesting part of the network that might represent a pathway that uh, is, is um, sort of more specific to your, your gene list. Um, so instead of having someone's predefined notion of a particular pathway, you kind of discover a new part of the network that is potentially a pathway, 
the, the issue with it is that you usually have to interpret a little bit more because nobody's said that that part of the network is uh, a particular pathway. Um, and so you have to look at what that network means. But that's sort of just an example of um, using network information and how network information can help you uh, do it a little bit more and provide more information potentially than gene sets. Um, so before we get in, so I'm going to give you a, um, uh, a, um, an overview of a few different topics. Um, one of the, uh, including just sort of talking about networks in general and network visualization. So, um, and then after we can talk about Cytoscape, which is you guys have tried out as a network visualization and analysis tool. Uh, and then tomorrow morning, um, we'll talk more about Cytoscape and we'll use network, uh, we'll use Cytoscape to create enrichment maps. And we'll also talk about gene function prediction and some other, other things that are more network based. So this is more of an introduction about networks. Okay, so one of the um, sort of the, the general idea with network analysis is that you you have uh, some network similar to uh, pathway enrichment analysis, where you had your gene list and you have your your attribute, your gene sets or your pathways, and you look for enrichment. Uh, for network analysis, uh, you have network information like protein interaction data, and you have um, attributes like gene expression data. You may also have a gene list. And you want to combine that information together and analyze it and visualize it. And often the result is a network that you can visualize and, and, and interact with, a network of genes and their relationships. And uh, often you'll see pictures of gene-gene uh, interaction networks in papers. And um, so, so there's a, usually a task. Because network networks are very visual, it's like a diagram instead of something like a p-value or a table like we were looking at in, in David enrichment. Um, there's also, um, people are also often interested in how to prepare a network visualization for publication. Um, so, and, uh, so I'll talk about that and I'll, um, um, this is sort of the standard workflow, so I'll talk about networks and also how to interpret networks. Um, if, you're, if you're interested in um, a specific example of this workflow, there's a paper we published a few years ago in Nature Protocols about how to use Cytoscape to analyze gene expression data in the context of networks. Um, Okay, so uh, networks represent relationships, which uh, can be any type of relationship. So typically in biology, we have four, there's four different types of relationships. Uh, physical relationships, which are like protein-protein interactions. Protein A binds to protein B, and they're actually touching each other. There's a direct connection in the cell. Uh, regulatory relationships, which are like you have a, uh, a regulator tar uh, and a target, and the regulator regulates the, the target. So that's like transcription factors or microRNAs or kinases. Um, and often people draw these, these types of networks as an, with an arrow. So you have a, a transcription factor activates a target, activates gene expression of a target, or represses gene expression of a target. You might have a, a T-shaped arrow instead, like a bar for inactive, for down, um, um, inactivates. Um, genetic interactions are um, sometimes seen as well. They're not really just, it's not like a, it's a, it's a very specific type of relationship like you might have, you might have heard of epistasis. These are um, relationships that you get when you, what you observe when you um, mutate multi, uh, a pair of genes, for instance, and the, um, the phenotype of the the double mutation is unexpected given the phenotypes of the single mutations. Um, this is more often found in model organisms, but there are a fair amount of genetic interactions in, in available for human. Um, a, a strong example, an extreme example of that is synthetic lethality, where you have, uh, if you knock out one gene and nothing happens to the cell, you knock out another gene and nothing happens to the cell, but you knock out both genes and the cell dies, those two genes are probably in parallel pathways buffering each other. And so that's a very different type of relationship than physical interactions. Um, and then finally, functional interactions are a more general category of interactions that uh, relate genes because they're similar in function. And they might be co-expressed or they might, be, they might have similar sequence. Um, and so all of these types of uh, interactions are also are functional interactions, but functional interactions can also be very general. Like, two genes are co-expressed. Um, it doesn't tell you if they're interacting or if they're in the same pathway, but you know that, they're, that they are um, uh, somehow related, uh, potentially functionally. Um, so re relate networks are um, 
useful for discovering relationships in large data sets. So if you have uh, a lot of connections if, uh, between your data, like similarity relationships, you can uh, visualize them as a network and you'll see the relationships very clearly. If you put that into a, a spreadsheet, you won't be able to see them very clearly. The other good thing about networks, another good thing about networks is that it's very useful for visualizing multiple different data types together and that allows you to see interesting patterns in your data. So here's um, um, three different examples of how networks can be represented, just as a background, a bit of background. Um, here's a list of relationships, as you might input in a spreadsheet. If you're going to store network information in a spreadsheet, you can say A is connected, A1 is connected to A2, A1 is connected to A3, etc. Say you have a spreadsheet and there's column one, column two, and then you can have additional columns so that are optional. In this case, I, there's another column here with the weight. Um, this might be this might, might represent the strength of the interaction, but it could represent other things. Um, here's the actual network representation of the same the same set of relationships. So here we've plotted as a network, and it's much easier to see that um, a, a nodes six or um, circles six, eight, and nine are kind of forming a little triangle here. Kind of hard to see that from this this uh, view. Um, you can also um, make the thickness of these lines proportional to the weight, this weight. So A1, A3 is the thickest lines, one of the thickest lines. Um, and so you can visualize different types of attributes. Here we also have a, um, so this is the A3, A5 connection, which is here in blue. Um, here's the A5 to A4 connection. There's an arrow here to signify that it's only the directionality of the connection is only from 5 to 4. So um, some tech uh, terminology around networks. Um, these circles are called generally called nodes and uh, the lines are called edges um, often. Sometimes these nodes are called vertices uh, and this terminology comes from computer science which uh, and math which have studied networks for a long time and they call it uh, they, in the field of graph theory. So sometimes you might also see networks referred to as graphs. In biology we tend not to use the term graph um, because often when you if you just um, ask people, most people, what a graph is, they'll probably plot, point to a plot or tell you about a plot, not a network. So network seems to be more um, easily recognized by most people. Um, you can also represent networks as a heat map, in which case um, each circle here represents, uh, each square here represents one of these edges uh, or connections. And um, all of the nodes in the network are represented on both axes here. And um, this, uh, if you have a connection between a node, it, the square, uh, the corresponding square gets colored in. And in general, this is sort of symmetric around this axis here. Uh, most of the squares on this side of, on this lower half, lower triangle of the matrix are the same as the ones on the upper triangle, um, except for this green one here, which is only um, at, present in one direction. Um, the weights are colored, are um, represented here as colors instead of thicknesses of lines. And um, the this heat map or, or matrix was clustered to put similar, um, similar uh, nodes together. So these nodes have sim a similar pattern of connectivity. And this is six, eight, and nine, which is this little guy here. These nodes have kind of similar connectivity pattern here, and that's this little group here. So this is useful for sort of seeing groups or clusters in the network. Um, this is a less, less um, common representation, but you definitely see it in the literature, and that's why I've included it here. Um, it's, uh, but but the, the take home message is that all of these are equivalent, and I guess also this, this is the common representation of a network. So this is an actual example of a biological network uh, where all the nodes are proteins and all the lines are protein interactions. Um, the, uh, we've overlaid gene expression data on this. So these are yeast proteins. Um, and we've overlaid function data. So uh, proteins that are known to be part of the kinetochore are colored blue. Um, nucleosome proteins are green. And replication fork proteins are, are pink. And the yellow ones are others. Um, the, the connections here, some of the connections are thicker than others. This means that the genes, that these two genes or the, um, that encode the proteins are highly 
uh, correlated in their expression in a particular expression experiment that we overlaid. The expression experiment in this case was um, from yeast that was looking at genes and how they were changing in expression over the cell cycle. So the genes in this cell cycle are going up and down, and if you have genes that are going up and down at the same time, they're, co they're correlated in their expression and it gets a thick line here. So you can see all these guys here are very thick lines. It probably means that um, it means that all these uh, genes, which are also in the nucleosome, are going up and down at the same time. Um, yep? So if the thickness of the lines represent the expression correlation, what does the length of the line suggest? So in this case, um, the length of the line doesn't, is not mapped to any kind of information. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. But um, this is uh, just laid out so that the nodes are not highly overlapping each other, so you can see things. and the, the line length is drawn however it needs to be so that that happens. Um, that's a good question. The, the, next, the, the other type of information is the size of the nodes. Um, that's, we, we map the transcriptional, transcription amplitude. That is the highest level of transcription that a, a gene reaches in the cell cycle. So it's, genes are going up and down. Some of the genes are getting, like the highest level is really high, and some of them the highest level isn't that high. So the bigger the, the circle, the more higher the expression is at some part of the cell cycle. So you can see again, like right away, here's um, a whole set of genes that are like re have really high expression. So if, if you, you were just to look at this naively, you might think, oh, the nucleosome is really important in the, well, I guess all of this is important in the cell cycle, but the nucleosome is really highly expressed and all expressed together. Um, all these genes have thick connections between them. They're highly correlated in their expression. So this is probably a, um, and we know that this is a complex that probably gets expressed all at the same time, and it's expressed highly at a particular moment. Um, and um, so you, in that way, you can kind of see a relationship between protein interactions, which are the edges, the thickness, gene expression correlation. Um, so you can get some idea about the dynamics of this complex. Um, and then the other, other things that you can see are just the general relationships of this. I'll talk more about this figure later in terms of how to interpret networks. So if you see a network like this, um, what patterns do you look at, look for to get out, you know, what, do, what information do you take home from this network? So I'll talk more, a little bit more about that later. So this is, as it stands, is just an example of um, putting a lot of information together on a network. Question, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I can't remember what it was here, but it was probably like time zero or something in the cell cycle. Um, okay. So, um, what's the difference between pathways and networks? So we talk about we've talked about pathways. Most biologists understand. Um, the idea of a pathway, um, and the um, or, or if you if if you if you've given if you're if you're told the name of a pathway as a biologist, you usually recognize that. If I tell you apoptosis, you'll say, "Oh, it's a pathway." Um, um, whereas a, a network, I've showed you, it's just a set of relationships. Um, pathways are also sets of relationships, right? You have uh, um, relationships between between uh, aspects of the pathway. The pathways generally have a lot more information associated with them. Um, here's a metabolic pathway that has a uh, series, of, this is glycolysis, it has a series of chemical reactions. Um, so usually in pathways there's a uh, kind of a, step, a series of steps that occur. So often it's more of a process, not just a static diagram. Um, so you're trying, or at least pathways are, uh, pathways are trying to capture some information about a, set, a series of steps. Um, it does. Uh, here's a. It's hard to see here, but these are these are other types of um, networks and uh, that um, some people use, like gene regulatory networks and the signaling pathway, um, metabolic pathway. And here's like a really big network of protein-protein interactions. Um, so uh, the main difference between pathways and networks is that pathways tend to have. Uh, more of a, pro a diagram of processes or trying to capture information about the process, the biological process, like a series of steps, and there's a lot, usually a lot more detail with the pathway. So you can take pathways and convert them to networks, but it's harder to go back from networks to pathways because when you convert pathways to networks, you lose information. You can also convert pathways to gene lists, right, or gene sets. 
just take the set of genes that's in a pathway. You, you, you lose a lot of information at that point. You don't even know how genes are connected. You just know that they're all part of the same pathway. Um, so um, there's sort of a, a hierarchy of, of information and in pathway analysis. Gene set, network, and pathway is sort of the highest level of detail. Okay, so that's, um, uh, I, I, we're, I'm not covering a lot of um, t uh, content about pathway databases as part of this, this uh, particular workshop. And the reason is, is that um, uh, currently most people are analyzing or doing pathway analysis using gene sets and networks. Um, we haven't really gotten to the point with software that it's very easy to do anything more than um, to use all the information that's in pathways, um, even though we'd like to, and eventually people will and more tools will be available to make better use of the rich information that's in pathway databases. Um, so right now people are kind of mapping them to gene sets and networks and using them as, as that. Okay, so um, mapping biology to a network. So a network is a very abstract concept, any relationship can be represent set of relationships is a network, um, like relationships between people. Um, but in biology, um, you have to uh, m decide what the nodes and edges mean. So um, you could say that one you know, each node is a protein and each edge is a protein interaction, like we did in the previous in the, the big network that I showed you. Um, but they can represent anything. So uh, a node can represent um, a more re more information, more realistic. Mapping, so maybe you're only interested in in showing the proteins that are present at the same time and place. Um, maybe that's more realistic. Um, edges uh, or interactions don't necessarily have to be physical interactions. So I mentioned that there's different types of interactions: physical, regulatory, genetic, functional interactions. Um, it's very important to, when you look at a network the, um, to ask to find out what the what the nodes and edges mean. Um, so here's an example of a really big network, and um, it would be bad if you if you thought this was just because you, you, a lot of pro a lot of networks are protein interaction networks. It wouldn't be very good if you thought that this was a protein interaction network because this is actually a protein sequence similarity network. So all of the nodes here are proteins, but the edges are represent sequence similarity. And the color, the brighter the color, the more sequence similar the proteins are. And there's, I think, a million proteins represented here, so it's impossible to see any little protein. But the these uh, regions here are protein families. They're clusters of proteins that have similar sequence that, that are similar to each other. And from this plot, you can sort of see there's little dense regions and I can, you, maybe you can even draw boundaries around these and start defining protein families. That would be a useful thing to do with this network. This, so this is just the idea that relationships don't have to be the typical types of relationships that you might think about. Okay, and um, the um, network, uh, uh, one of the, so I told you that networks are useful to represent relationships and they're also useful for visualizing lots of different types of information on the at the same time, um, but they're also useful for analysis. And one of the interesting things that have that or that have happened in, in network research and its application to biology is that um, people that there's a lot of algorithms out there that that can be um, applied from network theory or graph theory from computer science to biology. So, um, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, computer scientists and mathematicians have studied graph graph theory for a very long time, and there's all sorts of algorithms available um, because of that. So there's algorithms for um, lots of different things, and some of them can be used to answer biological questions. So here's a, an example. Um, how many people have heard of six degrees of separation, this idea? So most, most people. So um, the, uh, this, this is the idea that everyone in the world is connected to everyone else with at most six, six links, so things sort of in, in terms of friendships. Um, it's probably less now because of Facebook, um, but um, this, was, this, this uh, idea came out of research from Stanley Milgram in the 60s who uh, gave people postcards with a name and said, try and get this postcard to the person without knowing their address. And some of, many of the postcards made it to, their, to, the, to the other person, to the other end, and he counted the number of hops that the postcards took. And then you know, on average, it was six to six links. So, um, if you had a connect, a big network of all of the, the uh, friendship relationships on the planet, like Facebook, um, you could 
answer this question without doing the postcard experiment, which is time consuming, costs a lot of money at stamps. But um, the, uh, so the question would be, how are two people connected? Which path should we take? And um, in computer science, there's an algorithm called shortest path by breadth first search that basically searches a, a network to, um, starting out, going out uh, breadth first, out, out um, sort of for, starting from a node, it tries all of the you know, its neighbors and then goes to the next level, the next level. By the end of the, uh, of the algorithm, it, it is guaranteed, com computational uh, computer scientists have proven that it will find the shortest path if one exists. So if a, if a path doesn't exist, it won't find one. And if it does exist, it will find one. And it's guaranteed to be a shortest path. It doesn't have to be, um, there could be actually more than one shortest path. But it, it will find at least one of them. In fact, if you ask, it will find all of the shortest paths, all of the paths that could be equally short. Um, so that might be interesting in biology if you're interested in how proteins are connected. I have two proteins of interest. I want to see how they're connected. I want to see how they're connected in the network. So um, you could, you could Ask, answer that question using this algorithm. Um, is this biologically relevant? You're, that that's another question. That's another um, story because maybe the shortest path isn't the actual best path, it, biologically best path, but it is a it it is um, um, an, an inter potentially interesting path. So this is sort of another question on top of that. Computer science doesn't tell you if it's biologically relevant. So. Um, since about the past 10 years, people have been studying networks a lot in biology and developed lots of interesting applications. Um, gene, people have used networks for gene function prediction, um, which I'll mention uh, uh, again in a, a couple of times in a bit and, and tomorrow morning. Um, people have used uh, networks to find protein complexes or other modular structures in large networks, uh, to study network evolution, uh, to predict new interactions between genes. Um, and also, there's quite a lot of interesting applications in, in disease research. So um, instead of looking just at individual genes, people have uh, found networks that are correlated with disease subtype or disease. So if you have uh, disease versus normal, um, which networks, um, and you have gene expression data, for instance, uh, with, with um, uh, present or available for, for all this, uh, a bunch of samples, you could look for regions of the network that are highly differentially expressed in disease and not in normal. Um, and that might be a region, an interesting region of the network. There was a, uh, a couple of years ago, there was a good paper from Trey Eidecker's lab about breast cancer and finding networks that were um, associated very specifically with breast cancer gene, uh, using gene expression data. Um, and this, this ties into subnetwork based diagnosis. This is the idea that biomarkers or markers of disease um, don't just necessarily have to be genes. They could be a set of genes. Um, you could use gene sets for this, but you can also discover um, automatically the best uh, um, sets of genes that, that are connected in a network and might represent a particular little pathway or system that is important for um, the outcome that is related to the outcome of the disease that you could use for diagnosis or prognosis. Um, and uh, um, this is sort of the same type of thing in a GWAS, uh, gene, gene, genome-wide association study type of view. So um, these, uh, each of these, these um, examples, um, there's a, there's a, um, a, uh, a name under here, which is actually a name of the Cytoscape plugin that does, does these different uh, analyses. So if you're interested in some of these analyses, you could look up some of these um, Cytoscape <coughs> plugins. Okay, so what's missing in a typical network? Um, t a typical network and, and also pathways uh, typically are static, so um, and generally represent all of the information that's available that we know about uh, that could happen at any given time in in a cell. Um, they generally don't represent what's happening in a particular cell at a particular time, um, and so um, that is. Uh, um, uh, actually context here, so cell type and developmental stage. They also, um, it's sort of related to dynamics. Dynamics can also be, you know, the uh, changing of concentrations of components over time. Um, it's difficult to represent some of these things, like a calcium wave or a, or a um, uh, like a, a wave of information in a neuron or something like that, wave of electrical conductance. So usually people represent that with a more detailed mathematical representation that um, can handle this and usually that's a, um, um, a simulation model that can 
work at a very high level of detail and simulate uh, process over time and all the concentrations and changing, so uh, and how they change. So we, we are not going to cover this, but there's some pointers if you're interested in this. Typically, this requires a lot more information than we t than we usually have about um, pathways. And so for genomics studies, you never get to this level of detail because you're working with the whole genome, which we don't have a lot of information needed for this about all, all the genes. Um, also, we tend to represent proteins as circles or genes as circles, but obviously there's a lot more detail, like atomic structures and domains and proteins, and so often that's not in the network either. Okay, so, so in general, networks are, are useful for representing, for seeing relationships in large data sets, much better than tables. Um, the important thing when you see a network is to um, understand what the nodes and edges mean. Um, there are many methods available for gene list and, and network, or, sorry, for, for network analysis. And um, there's two ways of kind of uh, approaching this. And one, it's sort of, I guess uh, we need to develop more textbooks of, about network analysis. But currently, it's a little bit of a challenge to figure out the right network analysis for your problem. So you can um, either become an expert in all the different analyses and then figure out um, uh, which one is best for you, but that's usually too time consuming. Or you can define your question and have a very specific question and look for, look for answers. You, uh, often it's, it's if you have um, someone knowledgeable that you know, um, you can ask them, given this question, what, what uh, uh, network analysis method should I use to answer this question? Um, so that's probably a good way of doing it, sort of determine a question. I want to see differentially expressed networks. Um, I tried to give you some examples in the, in the beginning uh, or in a couple of slides ago, and then later on when we talk about Cytoscape, I'll tell you a lot about different plugins and different um, types of questions that they can answer so you can get a flavor for it. Okay, so um, the second part of this, uh, this in network introduction is network visualization. Um, did, did anyone have any questions about the first part? Any more questions? Okay, so um, network visualization is, is pretty quick, but um, just a, a few notes about it. Um, uh, I showed you a nice network that looks like this. Um, this is the result of network layout. And um, if you didn't have, uh, so, so one of the most important uh, aspects of network visualization is network layout. So uh, luckily there are automatic algorithms that, that can help you get an, a layout like this automatically. Um, if you didn't have that, you would have a network like this. So if you just took all the genes, if you were looking at a protein interaction network and you were looking and you, you wanted to draw it out manually, if you just drew circles for every protein and then start connecting them up, you'd probably get a hairball that looks like this. And people, when they see networks like this, they usually call it a hairball. Um, but uh, because it looks like a tangled mess and it's very difficult to interpret. So um, luckily there's, there's, as I said, there's layout algorithms, automatic layout algorithms that, that um, uh, um, lay out the network in a much more intelligible way. So one of the main types of network layout, uh, so the, the main goal of network layout algorithms is to um, uh, arrange nodes so that they don't overlap and reduce overlap of edges because the more crossing of edges or interactions you have, the more of a, a nest or mess you, you make. So um, one of the ways of doing this is called a force-directed layout, um, which you might see in Cytoscape or other, other network analysis tools. Um, this is, uh, uh, the way that this network layout works is that it, it uh, simulates the, the network as a as a as a physical system where nodes are repelling each other and edges are pulling nodes together. So the balance of those, it's, and it simulates the forces between nodes and edges. Edges are pulling like springs and nodes are repelling like like charged um, particles and um, sort of simulates throwing the network up in the air and having all those forces resolve themselves when it lands. All of the nodes um, that are highly connected are pulled by lots of edges, even if they're repelling each other. They're repelling each other so they don't overlap very much. And nodes that are that are distantly connected are farther away in the network. So um, and that, that works really quite well for most networks. Um, so that's usually if you see a force-directed layout, or sometimes it's called spring-embedded or an organic layout. Those are good layouts to try in general for any network. Um, and they're generally good for up to 500 nodes before 
um, you start getting this hairball effect where it's difficult for the layout algorithm to uh, reduce number of edges because there's just too many edges. So if you have lots of edges and nodes, um, you can uh, try and reduce the, the amount by filtering it um, to a more specific subset if you're having problems visualizing large networks. Um, also, um, just a couple, couple of quick points about making networks look nice. If you wanted to make a, um, a uh, publication quality network that you were going to um, publish in a, in a journal, um, you, it's a good idea to not just rely on, an, on automatic layout, but manually adjust the layout after you've done this automatic layout. Um, and you can also load the network into a drawing program like Illustrator or something to make, uh, adjust labels. And that's what we did for the network, that, the big network that I showed you before. Um, so I mentioned that um, uh, really big networks are difficult to visualize. And if you have a very, very big network, like all the protein interactions in human, you probably won't be able to visualize it very effectively. It will look like this. So it's all. Um, there's two ways of solving that problem. One is zooming into a specific um, area of interest, like a particular pathway, and just focusing on that pathway. And another way is reducing the number of edges if you have some way of doing that. Like if you have protein interaction confidence values, you can just visualize the most confident uh, interactions. Um, I also mentioned that uh, it's networks uh, are useful for uh, visualizing a lot of different information at the same time. And I showed you, uh, you know, in the network there were circles and different colors and different thicknesses of lines. There's a lot of different visual features that you can use to uh, um, map information. So we we mapped um, in this in this network here back to this this network. We mapped um, node color to gene function, node size to uh, transcription amplitude edge size to edge gene expression correlation. This is up to your imagination how you want to do this, but you can layer on a lot of different types of information using different visual attributes. Okay, so back to this network that I showed you, um, and I talked about, uh, promise that I'd come back to uh, looking for patterns in this network that are useful biologically. So how to visually interpret a network. Um, there are generally three types of patterns that, that are recognized in biology as being quite useful for um, looking at understanding biological networks. So if I gave you this network and asked you, you know, what is special about this network? What does this network tell me? Um, so I, I already mentioned that looking for pat general patterns between visual attributes, like all these circles are highly connected and they're big and they're all the same color, and um, they're, 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 they're the edges that are connecting them are thick. So you kind of see a lot of um, types of data um, coming together to to be to sort of stand out. Um, uh, there's a there's th that sort of a sort of a general a general um, um, method to to look for interesting relationships between types of data. Um, there's also this idea of guilt by association. So if you notice, uh, what, what, was, what was noticed very early on when people started visualizing networks, uh, like biological networks, is that uh, genes that were known to be similar function usually hung out in the same parts of the network. And you can see that here. All the Connecticut genes are blue, and they're all very highly connected. Maybe there's a blue one over here. But in general, there's, um, there's, uh, you know, they're, they're connected to each other more than they're connected to other things. So um, that has been used for gene function prediction. Um, if you don't know that uh, this gene here is involved in the, or one of these genes in the middle here is involved in the kinetochore, say this gene here, which is yellow, say I didn't know the function of this gene, um, but I saw that it was connected only to kinetochore genes, um, the more connections the better, in this case it only has one, then I would predict probably that it's involved in the kinetochore. And so I would make a functional, a gene function prediction that this, this gene should be blue right, because it's only connected to blue genes. Um, here's an example of a gene that's sort of connected to a bunch of blue genes and a bunch of green genes. So it might be, we might think that it's mediating, uh, it's sort of participating in both functions and maybe it's relating to the connection, the physical connection or signaling connection between these two, uh, um, these two gene functions. Um, so that's guilt by association. That's the basis of most gene function prediction. So um, that, again, that's the idea that uh, 
genes that are, have similar function are, are more likely to interact with each other. And so if you have a gene that's unknown function, that uh, without a function, and you see that it's interacting with a lot of genes of known function, you can predict that it's at, um, with some level of accuracy that it's part of that function as well. We'll talk more about th that tomorrow. Um, another pattern is dense clusters. So um, you notice that uh, there's a few dense, densely interconnected regions. Um, it was also, it, it was realized early on that these often represent, in a protein interaction network, often these represent protein complexes, and people use that uh, method to, um, people develop, develop methods to find these clusters and then predict protein complexes or new members of protein complexes. In other types of networks, like the protein sequence similarity, dense clusters might mean something else, but generally they're interesting. Um, and then there's also global, and so that's something that people look, at, look for. Um, there's also global relationships, which uh, um, you know are general relation, general global relationships between different parts of the network. So the kinetic core is one part of the network, seems to be more highly connected to nucleosome, um, and then that's more highly connected to the replication fork. There are some connections, direct replication fork, kinetic core connections, but it seems to be a, you know fewer than than going through here. So that might tell you something about the overall structure of the network that you're looking at. And people have used this type of relationship to define maps of the cell from very large protein interaction or genetic interaction um, maps. And so you can, you can get a sense of which processes are more closely related to each other. Any questions? So, so to, to recap, um, uh, just a quick introduction. Uh, the first step of network visualization is automatic layout. You have to do that before to just visualize a network. Um, and uh, there's a, a, quite a, a number of patterns that you can um, visualize to get, um, um, together, and I've said that, repeated that a few times now. Um, if you ever find yourself looking at a network that's very complicated, try to reduce it into a uh, focus into a, a um, focus your analysis by removing nodes and edges that might be less important. Um, so uh, everybody, uh, yeah, question? Uh, for the source of, uh, who entered the data for, uh, and reports that, for example, gene A and gene B, protein A and protein B, are connected in a net group, not in a pathway? So uh, there are many pathway, uh, many network databases, um, or many databases that store um, protein protein interactions or other types of relationships. So for instance, the intact database is a is a, a protein protein interaction database that um, curates protein interactions from the literature. Um, so if you're just interested in networks and you mentioned um, um, not pathways, there's there's databases that just focus on protein interactions or genetic interactions and they're curating these from the literature. Um, a lot of protein interactions come from large scale screens and they're pulling that data in as well. For pathways, there are pathway databases and pathway curators. A couple of people are here um, who are doing pathway curation um, and uh, for the reactome database. But um, in general, it's curated. And sometimes it can be predicted. Um, so you just have to know which data, like if the database has curated information or predicted information. Um, on the wiki, there's a link to pathway databases and, and network databases that are um, pretty good. Um, including a link to a website that, that we maintain that lists uh, all the hundreds of pathway databases that, that we've found um, and interaction databases as well. It's called PathGuide. So the process is the same somehow, but uh, for all those connections that contribute to a specific process, they fit into a certain pathway database, and for those, we, should, we don't have any confirmed relation yet, if you like. Uh, so networks might be, a net, like a protein interaction database is a very specific type of uh, interaction, but um, it's only protein interactions. Pathway, uh, a pathway might include many more types of relationships, like um, protein A binds to B and phosphorylates it, and that phosphorylation changes the conformation of B, and then it becomes active and, can and it can do something else. It can bind to this other guy, um, and, um, and then that guy gets cleaved. And the two, one product gets degraded, and the other product becomes a, a signaling peptide or something like that. Um, so that's much more detailed information. Whereas in the protein interaction database, they'll just say A binds to B. They won't capture all of that info, that detail. But it may state if A binds to B when it's phosphorylated, it might state also 
it might have the strength of binding, um, but generally the post-translational modifications are, um, they might be, uh, it might be annotated, but I'm not sure how often they're really no. required for binding. Yeah, it could do that, but yeah. So, um, yeah, any other questions? Okay, so um, everybody uh, was, so, I'm just going to introduce Cytoscape. So Cytoscape is a network visualization and analysis tool that um, is freely available. And I think, um, so one of the assignments that we gave you, as you know, hopefully, uh, before the class was to try out the Cytoscape program by following the tutorials, the introductory tutorials online. The reason we did that is because um, it can take a little bit of time to go through those, those tutorials. Um, but those tutorials are fairly straightforward, so you can go through them. Um, and, uh, and then when we get to the class, we can focus in on analysis methods instead of spending most of our time figuring out how to use the software. Um, so that help, um, makes better use of the class time. So, um, but in the next, um, just before the end of this class, I'm almost finished here, we can try and use Cytoscape a little bit. Um, and um, I guess, I don't know how many people are typically staying afterwards. You can continue using Cytoscape. Um, I'll give you, I can give a quick demo of, of Cytoscape as well, but the important, uh, um, one important thing that we should do is make sure that everybody's set computers Cytoscape is working for, um, because tomorrow we'll be using Cytoscape in the lab, and we'll just assume that you have Cytoscape running normally, and you just, just um, we'll, we'll use it. So if during, after this lecture, um, if you haven't got Cytoscape running, or if you have some problem, put up your hand and the uh, TAs will help you with it. Um, okay, so um, Cytoscape provides, is a freely accessible tool. Uh, originally it was developed at the Institute of Systems Biology in 2001, um, 2002, and then since then it became a, an open source project that involved many labs. Um, including my, my own, um, but there's nine different academic and industry groups that are part of the Cytoscape team of people that build Cytoscape. Um, and it, uh, it, a lot of different types of network analysis t um, t uh, are, are available in Cytoscape. Um, so the general idea with, with Cytoscape um, mm -hmm. is that you collect information, network information from different places, databases, and whatever other places that you can collect it from. You load that, you have to collect that data, and then you load it into Cytoscape uh, and then you can you can uh, overlay gene expression data or other things, um, and then you can do uh, and you can run network analysis that are available as Cytoscape plugins. Um, I'll talk more about where you get the network data because that's that's um, something uh, important. So um, Cytoscape is uh, there's lots of network analysis tools. I guess one of the different things about, about Cytoscape is that it's one of the few network analysis tools that's really open source, and it has a big active community around it. And so there's a lot of tutorials, like the ones that you used. Um, there's annual conferences and tens of thousands of users. So there's a mailing list for discussion that if you end up really using Cytoscape a lot, um, excuse me, you can um, sign up to those mailing lists and get questions answered. Um, there's also many people have written plugins to extend the functionality of Cytoscape, and there's now over 100 plugins. Um, and if you know Java, um, you can build your own plugins, or if you know someone who knows Java, you can help the, you can get them to build plugins for you if, if you want to build your own to extend the functionality in new ways. So um, I'm not going to go through, uh, because you've already looked at Cytoscape, um, I just wanted to present this workflow that we've put together. Um, the uh, and then I'll just explain how gene lists fits in, in here. So, um, so typically you, you load up gene lists and gene attributes um, to, uh, and you, you get network information from, from somewhere. So these gene lists are coming from your experiments, gene attributes we talked about. Uh, network information needs to come from somewhere as well. Um, but you can load that all up into Cytoscape, and you can, um, you, there, there might be different types of networks, like protein interactions, or functional interactions, or regulatory network. And then you can do network visualization. So Cytoscape itself is all you need for network visualization. Um, and then you can do analysis. There's different types of analysis that you can do. So um, gene list comes from your experiment. Um, network information, I've, I've, um, so I put little words next to each of these boxes. 
These are plugins in Cytoscape that can help you with this box, with each box. So if you're interested in getting network information, you can use IREF Web, which is a, um, a, a, a da my favorite database of protein interactions that um, is, uh, um, collects all the protein interaction data that from many other databases and puts it together. Um, Gene Mania, we'll talk about that tomorrow. That has a large database of functional interactions and will probably satisfy most people's demands here for getting network information. Um, Agilent Literature Search is a tool from Agilent that allows you to type in a set of genes and then it tries to find relationships from those genes from the literature. It reads PubMed abstracts and it looks for relationships um, based on keywords like A binds to B, um, it will say, it will draw a link between gene A and gene B. Um, and then there's String, which is a tool like Gene Mania. Um, there's different types of analysis, gene set enrichment analysis, what we talked about this morning. Um, there's a Bingo plugin that does gene set enrichment analysis similar to David within Cytoscape. Um, if you're working within Cytoscape and you want to do enrichment analysis, then you might want to use Bingo. Um, and then tomorrow we'll talk about Enrichment Map, which is a plugin that allows you to visualize the results of enrichment analysis, uh, like the results of David, in a much uh, more intuitive way. So I'll really talk, talk more about that tomorrow morning. And we'll have a lab about that. Um, regulatory network analysis, there's a plugin called NetMatch, gene function prediction, we'll talk about that tomorrow, gene mania, um, module detection, like finding these dense regions, there's plugins um, MCODE and ClusterMaker, um, Reactome FI is a plugin we, we often usually teach as well as part of our pathway course. Um, but, uh, um, and then, um, so I've, I've just kind of made this workflow to give you a, a kind of map. If you're interested in any of these boxes, you can look up this plugin. And then also in, this, in the next slides, um, which I'm not going to go over, um, these, these next few slides are references, a little references of different Cytoscape plugins that um, if you're interested in particular things like visualization for gene expression data, you can look at the VistaClara plugin. Um, this is a little bit more detail about the Bingo plugin, which is on that first first uh, uh, workflow. Um, some of these and a number of these plugins are a number of the plugins that are listed on that workflow have a couple of extra slides about them, um, so that if you're interested, you can just learn more about them. But I'm, I'm not going to go through them. Here's the, the Agile Literature Search uh, plugin. Um, so if you're, it, it's uh, just a little bit of a, a set of interesting plugins. Um, there's a, and each one, a number of them have labs, so if you're interested in, in, um, in uh, working with this information, you can follow the, the uh, lab. Um, so here's a regulatory network motif finder. This will find like feedback loops, for instance, in a network. Um, and uh, there's quite a, quite a few other things. And at the very end, if you end up being a, a big user of Cytoscape, there's some tips and tricks of how to use Cytoscape better. But you definitely don't need to use, read that if you're a beginner user. But once you, get the, once you start using it, if you start using it a lot, some of these might be helpful. So those I just put in there for your reference. Um, and um, and uh, um, that's it. So uh, how much time do we have? I guess we're almost done. Um, any questions? I can probably, um, I was thinking that if we had extra time, we can, I can give you a quick demo of Cytoscape, but I don't know if that's fully necessary. Um, are there any questions? Yeah? Uh, have, you, have you or any other group tried to integrate this 325 pathway databases that you have provided in the past like, so that you can get a resource in which Yes, so uh, nobody's integrated all of the, so the question is, um, has anyone tried to integrate all the pathway information in the world together in one place? That would be the ultimate goal, and we really want to do that. So yes, people are working on that. No, it hasn't been finished. It's not finished. So um, there's two, uh, uh, a really, this IREF web is a really good resource for protein interaction data. So most of the protein interaction data is available through IREF web, um, and then there's a project that I work on called Pathway Commons uh, with Chris Sander at Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. And the goal of that project is to um, mer uh, con collect all of the pathway data from lots of different pathway databases so that it's in one um, accessible place so that everybody can get access to it very easily. And that will improve the ability of users to use pathway information. Um, so that's called Pathway Commons. And there is a Pathway Commons plugin for Cytoscape, so you can go into Cytoscape and um, 
and uh, pull down pathways from that the list and visualize them inside Escape. But I wouldn't say that it's finished yet, and I think there's quite a lot of work to do in that area. Um, so tomorrow we'll talk about Gene Mania, and Gene Mania has done a lot of, we've done a lot of work with Gene Mania to collect data, and we have um, more than 100 million interactions for human or something like that. So um, some of those are, a lot of those are co-expression links, but we have ton, collected tons of information. So um, ideally what you would want to do if you have a gene list, so there's, there's two, one, one thing I almost forgot about to mention is that there's two uh, important ways or to sort of different ways of using Cytoscape. So if you have a network already, um, maybe you did an experiment like a protein interaction experiment and it actually generated a network. Um, if you have that network, you probably want to visualize it and analyze it, and so Cytoscape is perfect for that. If you have a gene list, you have to convert your gene list into a network, and the way to do that is to put the gene list into one of these tools that finds all the connections between your genes, and may, may also include other genes that are connected to your genes, and that's um, this Gene Mania tool that we'll talk about tomorrow is very good at doing that. So you just give Gene Mania a list of genes, and it will, it will um, find out all their connections, and then you can start doing network analysis. Um, there's also a tool like that from Reactome called the Reactome Functional Interaction Plugin, which is also a Cytoscape plugin that's listed on that um, one of those slides, um, which is right, right here. Um, right, right here. Um, oh, sorry, Reactome FI. It's actually... Um, we could have actually, I should probably put um, like a separate box here that's converting gene lists to networks. Um, gene Mania and Reactome FI are two good plugins for that, but we'll focus on, on Gene Mania tomorrow. 